Sometimes I focus a little too heavily on the super duper fun stuff of point and care ultrasound. So that's advanced echo, doing diastology, doing ejection fraction, uh, looking at the pressures of the lung by looking at the heart, doing sweet nerve blocks where you're actually able to uh, alleviate patients suffering without having to give them any systemic medications. Sometimes I forget that it's just something basic like soft tissue ultrasound can dramatically change the course of a, a patient's um, weeks, uh, months, maybe even lives if you're able to differentiate between, let's say, a simple cellulitis with a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Or just you have a screaming kid and they have some redness. You're pretty sure there's an abscess on there, but you're not sure. Wouldn't it be great to just put that ultrasound on there and then know 100% if there is something to drain or not? That is where your ultrasound for soft tissue comes in. Now, I haven't done an update in a bit, so I wanted to share this lecture that I gave um, last week, actually, to some of our residents at the UHS Emergency Medicine Residency, where I currently work in Temecula, California. In this video, we are going to talk about cellulitis, we're going to talk about abscesses, and we're going to talk about necrotizing soft tissue infections. Check it out. All right, what we're gonna talk about today is basically like the three main infections. It's gonna be cellulitis, talking about abscess, and an NSTA or a necrotizing, sorry, NSTI, or necrotizing soft tissue um, infection. It's gonna be mostly the top two, a little bit on NSTI. Actually, you know, this is used to be called necrotizing fasciitis, but it's just one of those things that like, it's, it's better to call it a, a, a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Um, now, one thing here, uh, this is like data, um, is that the amount of these presentations that are coming to the ER and seeing their primary care physicians is just basically like skyrocketed. Um, the, the reason for it is probably due to MRSA. Uh, MRSA started around in like the 1990s. Um, and so after that, we just had so many more cases that it's not being treated by the kind of typical, me typical means. So they'll come and basically see us. Now, um, as far as the diagnosis, um, we typically, I don't know, ha we typically diagnose it, we see it, and if it looks like it's an abscess, we're going to treat it like, we'll try and cut it open, and if not, we might, you know, treat antibiotics and see how it does. That can work, but people can have complications, and surprisingly, our physical examination is really not as accurate as, as we might suspect, and part of it is, is understanding that if you see just like this, like a bump and there's already pus coming out of it. Like, yeah, that's probably an abscess, but it's in specifically the cases where there's a little bit of clinical uncertainty. Those are the ones in which um, the ultrasound really, I mean, it's, benef it's beneficial for every presentation, but it is much more um, beneficial in those um, cases where you're not hundred percent sure. So let's talk about the physical exam here. And these were the studies I could find. There's surprisingly not a whole lot of studies that just look at the physical examination. Um, so I think inherently some of us think it either you can go one way or the other. Either people might think, oh yeah, it's perfect. Or people might think, oh, we know it's not good. We're not going to study it. But in any case, it's kind of difficult to get studies just on the physical examination. But these are the studies that I could find that actually looked at the sensitivities and specificities for the physical examination. And I mean, they're they're okay, right? Um, we have a specificity here kind of low on this one. Say this is a pediatric study. Um, we have some specificity that's quite high, 94%. And this is essentially diagnosing an abscess because that's really what matters, right? Do we need to drain it or not? But here's the thing. If you tack on the ultrasound there and you compare the increase in sensitivity, the increase in specificity when you use your ultrasound, and these are the same population of patients, you can see here, the green is using the ultrasound, you can see here that the sensitivity dramatically increases. And that in medicine is what we want. We'd much rather have a more sensitive test than a more specific test. Um, so use your, I, what I do basically is I use the physical exam for its specificity. If I see pus spewing out of a geyser, I'm probably not gonna use my ultrasound, but if I don't see that, I'm probably gonna use my ultrasound to check because of that sensitivity. Now, there have been a lot of uh, meta-analysis that looked at this because there's actually a decent amount of data with the ultrasound. But this one, this one's my favorite one. Um, it was published in, it wasn't that long. It was a few years ago. It was probably like, I don't know, 2020, 2021. Um, and it definitely has nothing to do with who the second author is. But I happen to think it's one of the best meta-analyses and systematic reviews out there. It included 14 studies, 2,665 patients, or 56 patients, excuse me. And overall, 
the overall incidence here, or the overall accuracy has a positive likelihood ratio of 6.5 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.06. Great sensitivities, decent specificities. Now, what I like about what we did in this study is we actually separated out all the different patient populations, because that's actually an important consideration too. If you look at all comers, that was kind of what the initial posting was. Um, we separated out with adults. It's much more sensitive and specific in adults. And we could talk about why that might be adults compared to kids, but look at these likelihood ratios in adults, 10.9 positive likelihood ratio and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.01. That means that you can basically use that ultrasound to definitively rule in and rule out the presence or absence of an abscess. And then I also like this that we did down here, which I think is a very important consideration with soft tissue ultrasound. And that is separating out the patients that have clinical uncertainty versus those who have clinical certainty. Now, if you're pretty sure that that patient has uh, an abscess, it still works pretty well, but compare the sensitivities in those with clinical certainty compared with those with clinical uncertainty pretty similar, right? And that number dramatically goes down if you are just based off of your, you're just basing your management off of your physical examination. So this is basically a summary of the literature. I think that it is perfectly fine to use your physical examination for its specificity. Again, you see pus just flying out of there. It's like, it's like a geyser. Um, you don't necessarily need that ultrasound, right? But in those uh, cases where you're not 100% sure, the ultrasound is very helpful in ruling it out. I will say that most of the time, if I have a patient with suspected soft tissue infection, based off of my experience and based off of my interpretation of the literature, I'm usually going for that ultrasound. I mean, I have that, you know, the, the butterfly, the pocket ultrasound uh, ready to go. So that actually helps out a bunch. Um, but even if you don't, bringing that cart based machine with you on those uh, maybe borderline cases, um, I don't see a huge downside to using it because it does give you extra data that you can actually. Um, base your management off of. One of the things that I like too is that there's a couple of studies that have actually looked at how much it actually changes your management. Um, and our study as well looked at um, the studies that talked about how often it changed. So you had a, a provider, they saw it based off the physical examination, they kind of decided, I'm either going to lance this or I'm not going to lance this. Afterwards, they did the ultrasound, and in 10% of the cases, they changed. So either they didn't lance it when they were going to, or they did when they weren't. So this is something that's important for patient outcomes as well, and showing that it is beneficial to use. What was now, that image of? Oh, this is a, this is a squishy abscess. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show it later, but this right here, this is a, that's a good question. Um, this is a blood vessel right here, and this is a shooter's abscess. We don't have as much in California as we had where I used to be. I used to live in Kentucky, and there was quite a lot of um, IV heroin users in Kentucky relative to what I see here. Here, so it's all meth um, and other fun things here. Uh, but we did have a lot of shooters abscesses over there. Um, this one right here uh, is another one kind of showing uh, the benefit here. Now, this is at one specific site. It's a little bit older, 2006, but I like showing it. And they included 126 patients with a clinical diagnosis of a soft tissue infection. And they looked, so they decided, and then afterwards they did the ultrasound. And in this study, they found that when they had the clinical diagnosis of cellulitis, they did that ultrasound, 56% had a delta. So they had a change in management uh, when they used that ultrasound. And 73, when they were like, oh, it's an abscess, 73% of the time they switched. Um, so this just shows why I think it's so important and why to me, there's not a big downside on using um, the ultrasound for the majority, if not all of your patients. Now, one thing that I always like to do is I, I like to just do this like thought experiment. What is the benefit or I guess, how do we compare with the gold standard, right? And the gold standard for most soft tissue infections is going to be um, either radiology, ultrasound, TT scan, or MRI. Most of the time it ends up being that radiology uh, scan. Um, this was a study of 386 pediatric lesions, and they came up with some stats here. Um, and this is fascinating. So this is, they use the, uh, the basically the follow-up as the gold standard. So did it go away or did it get worse was essentially what they use as their gold standard. And the specificities were, were similar, right? Um, but look at the difference in this sensitivity, right? In the emergency department, they had a sensitivity of 80%, whereas the radiology department had sensitivity of 46%. It's nuts, right? Um, do you guys have any idea why this, why this might be the case? Is it because they're combining like physical exam features with 
what they find on uh, the ultra. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it is the, uh, the, the superpower, uh, the slight, uh, like leg up that we have as point of care providers, um, which, you know, total respect, utmost respect to our radiology colleagues. Um, but it is a person doing the scan and then another person reading, whereas we have the patient in front of us. So we intimately understand what's going on. We know exactly where it hurts. We can ask the patient questions while we do it. Um, which is another reason why I would much rather me do that soft tissue ultrasound rather than um, someone else doing it because I am also taking care of the patient. Bingo. All right, so that was a literature review on it. There's obviously more that we can talk about, but um, does anybody have any questions on that? No, sweet. All right, let's talk about how to scan. With most things that are superficial, we're gonna use our linear transducer because we want to uh, have the highest resolution, right? Now, if you have somebody that is uh, a bit on the fluffy side and they, uh, let's say they have a very um, deep infection, you might wanna use that curved linear transducer, especially if the depth of the thing you're looking at is greater than about five or six centimeters. Um, you might wanna use your, your curved linear, but otherwise linear is probably the, the best place to go. So this is a linear transducer looking at a forearm. We have our subcutaneous tissue. It's gonna have a bit more of a sort of lacy appearance here. And then with our muscle, we're gonna have a little bit more of a striated appearance. Um, we have some, this is a fascial plane right here, by the way. This is another fascial plane here. This is a muscle, here's another muscle. And then we have bones, cortex, and then we have um, some acoustic shadowing deep to it. So we're gonna kind of keep going like this and you can see this is what normal looks like. But what we wanna do is we don't really care about this stuff when we're looking at soft tissue ultrasound. What we care about is what's happening here, just in this layer. This is like the soft tissue layer, although that's honestly, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer because the soft tissue is everything that's like not bone. So muscle is technically soft tissue. Um, but most of the time when we talk about soft tissue, we're talking about basically that subcutaneous layer where um, you would get cellulitis or an abscess. So let's talk about cellulitis first. Um, this is a couple of different ways that it can present. So this is a normal subcutaneous layer right here, okay? This is normal. Um, this is basically what fat looks like on ultrasound. This is that same patient, but their other extremity. This is like the, uh, I think this was a lower extremity. And you can see here that we're not seeing the classic cobblestoning. Like we, we usually say cellulitis is cobblestoning, but Honestly, it doesn't always look like cobblestone. It just depends on how much edema that infection has. And if we look here, we have quite a bit of distortion on this left side of the screen, quite a bit of distortion of that uh, subcutaneous layer. We have some interesting kind of weird pseudo shadowing going on. I can't really see the architecture deep to it. If you have a patient that has warmth, they have redness, and you see this, this is early cellulitis, or it could be a cellulitis that doesn't have a whole lot of edema. And one of the things that I love about um, soft tissue ultrasound and a musculoskeletal ultrasound in general is like this, right? We can actually, if we're not sure if something's abnormal, especially if it's an extremity, we can actually look at the contralateral side. And if it looks the same, it's, it's unlikely to be abnormal, right? Um, especially if they only have symptoms on like one of their extremities. Whereas if we have the same thing and we look on the contralateral side and it looks completely different, that's probably pathology. So that's what's going on here. Now this right here, this is definitely the more classic view of cellulitis. Uh, this is that whole cobblestoning appearance. Looks like this. And what we're seeing here basically is we're seeing these little pockets of inflamed subcutaneous tissue with little wisps of edema kind of going through it. Now I said edema, and this is like an important consideration. How do you tell the difference between cellulitis and edema? I don't know if you guys are, um, you can unmute yourselves if you want to, or you can just not say anything and I'll just go forth. But any ideas on how to tell the difference between cellulitis and edema? I see some quizzical looks. I mean, if edema of the legs you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you won't have like erythema most of the time. It's not going to be warm to touch, not going to be tender to touch. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's the clinical picture, right? On ultrasound, you really can't tell the difference between cellulitis and edema just with the ultrasound. They look the same because it's the same thing. You have this, this fluid that's in between these little like pockets of subcutaneous tissue. Now, one thing that has been talked about is that the when something's inflamed, it has like fat stranding, right? 
Um, and fat on ultrasound usually is a little more echogenic relative to like regular structures. So, you know, some people argue sometimes that, you know, if it looks very bright, that that could be a finding that would help you differentiate between cellulitis versus edema. Um, also increased vascularity to that area because it's an inflammatory process, cellulitis, might actually push you towards that. But for me, I basically just look at the whatever it is I'm looking at. And if it looks like an infection, that's basically how I tell if it's edema versus cellulitis. It's the clinical feature. And that's an important thing with ultrasound, just like in general, because the ultrasound is not the only component. The ultrasound is a, is a tool that you use along with all the other tools that you have. So make sure that you keep um, that in mind. Now, this is not those things. Um, so we've been talking about cellulitis. Now we're going to talk about what an abscess looks like. We have a mixed echo texture, but mostly hypoechoic relative to the surrounding features. Um, encapsulated, fluid-filled, or mostly fluid-filled structure. Um, and yeah, this is what exactly what an abscess looks like. Now, there's a couple of features here um, that I also want to kind of call out just to kind of be aware of things. You notice how down here, it's a bit brighter than over here. This brighter than over here is called posterior acoustic enhancement. Um, and we see that because um, normally when we're going, when we're seeing the ultrasound, seeing things through tissue, what happens is as the sound goes through tissues, it is getting attenuated. It's basically getting like absorbed by the tissues rather than being reflected. So you lose a signal as you go deeper. The ultrasound machine artificially boosts the signal. So it kind of stays a uniform, uh, relatively a uniform um, brightness all the way down. Um, and, uh, what happens is when you have a fluid filled structure, there is no attenuation that happens here, which makes the boosting over here, make this seem brighter. It's boosting down here, the same as over here, but there's attenuation happening over here. So it's a certain, uh, brightness. Whereas over here, it's not necessarily boosting it any more than over here, but since there's no attenuation, this will be brighter. So that can help you know that this is actually fluid because it's brighter deep to it. It's an artifact. Um, and then if we look around just in general, all of this area here, it's quite bright, um, which is a finding of, you know, kind of like the fat stranding, um, which is another finding indicative of an infection. This right here is another just juicy abscess that I like love. And you can actually see, see how it's jiggling, kind of squishing back and forth. Sometimes what can happen is this to me is like super obvious, right? It's, it's very dark. It's very encapsulated, but sometimes the tissue within the abscess itself is going to be quite mixed as far as this echo texture. And sometimes you might not be 100% sure if what you're seeing is just like a big wisp of edema or if it's actually cellulitis. And this kind of movement of the material inside of it um, is actually quite helpful. Um, here's a quite encapsulated abscess right here. I actually like love this one because it's got a little pocket. And this is that picture that I showed you before, right? Now, if we look at this, right? Like this right here, if we just saw this in the middle, and compared it with what's next to it, it looks pretty similar as far as the echo textures, right? So we might have a hard time if we don't do a dynamic kind of thing. We might have a hard time knowing that this is an abscess. There's a couple of extra things that, you know, we already kind of talked about that will clue us in. One of them is, see how bright it is down here relative to over here? This is posterior acoustic enhancement, which happens when you have a fluid-filled structure more superficial to that posterior acoustic enhancement. That's one thing, but the other thing that I like to do is I, I do, which I think the first person I heard it from was either um, some EM ultrasound mentors of mine, uh, Lale Garabagian, and it was either her or Chris Fox uh, introduced me to the term pusistalsis. So it's like peristalsis of the pus basically. And if you see that, this actually can really um, help out. I'm gonna take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. Let's look at this right here. Now, this is now we're going to look at this and we're going to be like, oh, yeah, obviously that's an abscess, right? But this was actually missed. The resident did the scan and was like, oh, yeah, it's just cellulitis because they're just looking at this and there's no discreet, nice little pocket, right? But what I did is I went back and I'm like, I don't know, like this looks a little darker, this little sliver in the middle. Let's take a look at it. And we did a little squishiness 
And do you, do you see that? Do you see why, like, if I'm not 100% sure, I'm always going to do a little bit of compression to just see that squishiness. And we actually got a decent amount of pus out of this, probably like five or six cc's out of this, actually, um, that we might have sent this patient home if we hadn't done that dynamic uh, kind of test. We might have sent the patient home and they would have come back worse, right? So this is an actual little test that I typically do. Now, here's a couple of other examples, and these work pretty well. We see these, it's an important thing to kind of make sure that you fan through the entire thing. Sometimes you can actually see like a lymph node, for instance, and one thing you can do to differentiate between a lymph node and an abscess is you throw color flow on like inside the cavity thing. And if you see flow on the inside, it's actually a lymph node because lymph nodes have blood flow in them. And then if you just see blood flow around it, that's surrounding inflammation, um, that would be uh, an abscess. And you know, just like with most things in medicine, you know, it's, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can actually have a lymph node that has an abscess in it. So keep all of that in mind. Actually, I remember I had a case when I was a, I think I was a fellow or I just graduated um, where I had somebody with a big neck mass and I put color flow on it and it was, it looked like an abscess, but I put color flow, it had flow on the inside. Um, I talked to the ENT resident. I'm like, Hey, I think this is like a, a lymph node actually. And he's like, okay. And then he did his own exam. He just lands it and it was just pus flew out of there because it was an abscessed lymph node. So you can have both, but that's one of the ways he tell difference between the two. And for the most part, I'd recommend not opening up a lymph node. Um, and the way that you tell the difference is color flow on the inside versus color flow on the outside. It's kind of creepy. Um, we got to talk about how to look at the hands and the feet as well. Now, one of the things with, uh, with these linear transducers is that um, if you put a structure right on top of it, you're actually not gonna be able to see that structure very well. There's a bit of artifact that can actually happen. And it's it's kind of complex. And honestly, I don't really get it very well, but you have your your transducer like, um, can you guys see my screen by the, or let's see my camera? Okay, you have this transducer right here and the sound beams, basically they'll come down and they won't really focus. They have to like kind of narrow and then widen out. And right here is like the earliest place that they will actually be in focus, right? So if you put something up here, it's gonna be impossible for that ultrasound to actually be in focus. So your image is not gonna be as good. So what's probably the best thing to do um, is to create more of a space. Now you can do that by putting a glob of gel, like a bunch of gel on there, um, but sometimes that doesn't work very well. And probably an easier thing to do is to do a water bath. Now, as long as the casing is intact, I've never known of an ultrasound probe. I'm gonna speak specifically about a linear probe. I haven't tested this out with a phase or the curved linear probes, but I've never known a linear probe to not be fully waterproof, the casing itself. Like, you know, you don't wanna put the cable in the water, but the the head, the neck, the body of ultrasound transducers are all waterproof. So you can actually, you can actually put those directly into water. And what you can do here is you can fill any kind of a basin just with regular water. I usually like to do, um, not cold water and obviously not super hot water. So I try to do like tepid, a little on the warm side water uh, so it doesn't bother the patient. So what you do is you fill this up um, and then you just stick the patient's hand um, inside that water bath. You can see here that the resolution of the finger, just with your basic um, uh, basic transducers, nothing fancy is quite high. And you can see a lot of just really fine structures um, when you use that water bath. Um, and here's an example. So I'm not changing any of the settings on the ultrasound machine itself. I'm just putting the transducer, uh, basically the finger right on the transducer and then off. And notice as it moves away, it becomes more crisp and a bit brighter. And as it moves closer, it gets a bit darker. So that's just an example showing why having a bit of a space on the hands and on the feet, um, just because things are so superficial there, is a good idea with your ultrasound. You want to be about right there. Here is a little tiny infection. You'll see a little, this is a dorsal, uh, sorry, um, palmar aspect of a finger here, right here. Um, and you can see here, there's a little tiny fluid right there that is a, a felon um, that we actually got a decent amount of pus off of. Um, this is a hand infection right here. You can actually see the knuckles and you can see all of this disgusting cellulitis and an actual abscess that we're seeing, pulsostalsis. We had this in the water bath and it was a lot easier to see this. Now, one thing you can do, which one of my former residents uh, at the University of Kentucky, um, name was Jess Atkins, she actually kind of came up with this idea. She called it a sonosock, which I think is fascinating. Um, she basically used the emesis bag 
um, as a standoff pad. It went through the Amesis bag. It was amazing. It works well uh, for the hand, the foot. It can be a little tricky if like they have like a big feet, a big foot, um, because it's hard to like fit it in there. But it's an option, and this is like it was almost like a um, uh, because of problems it was like invented because we had so many patients in the waiting room and it was like inconvenient to fill that and like walk it out into the waiting room and we found this was actually like an easier way to kind of like do this scan it worked out pretty well actually um these things we try these kind of sample containers and they don't look as good um and then you can of course just use a regular old emesis basin um all of that works all right, let's talk about probably my favorite soft tissue uh, infection, which is a necrotizing soft tissue infection. This is the bad thing. You know what I mean? Like this is the one that, I mean, cellulitis by itself, it's, it doesn't have a super high mortality rate, same with abscess, but necrotizing soft tissue infections, a very high mortality rate, 25 to 35% mortality rate. And, and this is like the average. There's some places that report up to 75% mortality rate. This is like a big deal. This is something that they need antibiotics for sure, but the definitive treatment is actually surgery to get that whole area just washed out. And we definitely don't want to miss it. Now, with regards to the physical examination, we have all of these things that have been shown um, to be predict, or we're taught anyways are predictive of it, right? Um, and these are things, just like with most of these physical exam findings, these can be very specific, um, but they're horribly, horribly insensitive, right? Um, there's not a whole lot of studies out there actually that look at the accuracy um, of NSTIs because they're not super duper common actually. Um, but this one actually looked at the physical exam findings and they found that tenderness and erythema and warm skin to palpation, this was the most common findings. And how do you tell the difference between tenderness, erythema, warm skin to palpation? How do you tell the difference between that in an NSTI and a cellulitis? Like, you can't tell the difference, right? That's exactly the same way that cellulitis presents. So how do you know that it is actually an NSTI or not based off physical examination? If you look at all the classic ones, like bull eye, it's only present in 44%, right? If we look at skin necrosis, it was only present at presentation 13% of the time. So all these things that we hear, they are not sensitive enough for us to be able to say it's definitely not. Um, we have labs. We have this thing called a Lerinix score, right? Um, I'm sure you've heard of this. this is, it's basically the only like thing that we have, and it exists. And it it was internally created, internally validated. It had a positive predictive value for the initial study of 92 percent, and a negative predictive value of 96 percent. Like that's like amazing, right? Like why would we not use this on everyone? There's this thing called external validation. Um, we need things to be externally validated. If they are just positive in one site where it was developed, that is not great evidence. It's good, and sometimes like we have to use it. But when it was externally validated, it turns out that doesn't actually work all that well. This is a pretty big systematic review that actually included 18 studies, and uh, sensitivity is not that great. Big, broad range here, 43 to 80%, and the positive predictive value, 57 to 64%, negative predictive value of 42 to 86%. So it turns out that when you ex try to externally val validate the Lorenix score, um, it doesn't do very well. I mean, it's, it's, this is essentially like coin flip. It's a little bit better than a coin flip, but it's, it's kind of coin flip status. We have the x-ray. We can definitely use that. And you can see this. You can see if you see gas uh, on your plane films, that can be definitely predictive. But what's interesting is that not all necrotizing soft tissue infections are actually going to be from gas-forming organisms. So if you have a gas-forming a, a, a gas forming organism um, and it's enough for it to like produce enough to be seen on that x-ray, then you don't necessarily need that ultrasound, right? As long as there's no like trauma to the area but most of our patients won't present when they're this bad. Now, you definitely can do a CT scan. Interestingly enough, a CT scan also isn't perfect. It's got a sensitivity of 80 to 100% and a specificity of 80 to 91%. This is based off of a uh, systematic, or, or my own systematic review that's based off of these one, two, three studies here that actually I was able to find that um, use CT for the diagnosis of an uh, NSTI. And our MRI, and this was also fascinating to me, and this is based off of like the OR um, as the gold standard, had a sensitivity of 90% to 100%, pretty good. But look at these specificities. That's not actually not that good, right? So it, it can tell that there's an infection, but I guess it doesn't do very well for that level um, of an infection. Now, let's talk about the bedside test, the ultrasound. 
Now, there are more than one finding associated with um, an NSTI on your ultrasound. We talk about subcutaneous air, and that is pretty specific, kind of like the x-ray, right? But there's a bunch of other things that are associated with it. Thickening of the tissue, deep fluid collections, fascial irregularities, and then subcutaneous air. Now, there's not a whole lot of studies out there, um, but I'm going to talk about the accuracies of them in a second. This is an NSTI on ultrasound. So we can see here, there's little kind of little points here of subcutaneous air. This is all hyper echoic. And then we have some dirty acoustic shadowing deep to it. This combination with uh, some salitic looking kind of soft tissue above it. This is the more classic presentation of an NSTI or a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Um, this right here, this is actually in the scrotum. Now, this is a little interesting right here, right? So you see this super bright line right here. This is this, this is like a thickened, very thickened scrotal tissue. This is a quite a bright line. And then do you have any idea what this is down here? It's an artifact. Is this kind of like an A-line? It is an A-line, exactly right. And where's the other place that you see A-lines? Anything that has uh, air filled. Exactly. We normally see in the lungs, right? So if we see a very bright line here with an A-line, that is a very thick and uniform layer of air. And if we see air anywhere outside, basically of intestines and lungs, it's abnormal. This is what Fournier's gangrene looks like. We're not seeing the kind of little uh, dirty shadowing with the little pinpricks of hyperechoic gas, which we saw it a little bit right about right here, little pinpricks right here, but there's so much air in there that it's just a uniform layer of air. And it's creating this um, almost like a plural line type appearance with an A line deep to it. Now, this was something that was very interesting to me when I like I kind of stumbled across this pretty late, actually, like I stumbled across it like a couple of years ago. Um, and this study was done in 2013, actually looked at uniform layer of fluid deep to the subcutaneous tissue. Now, I, I did talk about this in conference, I think either last conference or conference before that, that this finding this uniform kind of thickness of fluid deep to it, uh, deep to the subcutaneous layer and above the muscular layer, this was actually highly specific according to this one study for a necrotizing soft tissue infection. So you can see here um, that they looked at this fluid accumulation and they found that it was actually one of the more predictive findings um, that show that it was an NSCI versus cellulitis. I do have subcutaneous emphysema on here, but look at this. I mean, they had 48 patients with OR diagnosed neck fascia, which is the gold standard, and only three of those actually had subcutaneous edema, or excuse me, subcutaneous emphysema. So only three out of the 48 actually had air in general, right? So that's why this isn't like as robust, although it, it wasn't present in any of the regular cellulitis patients. And that's why I'm I lately quite focused on that um, fluid accumulation as part of it. And they actually did some calculations on how thick that layer of fluid uh, needs to be. And obviously the thicker that fluid layer is, the more specific it is. And they used a, a nice cutoff here of anything bigger than a four millimeter level thickness was they thought specific enough, which I get it, 93 to 97% specific. I think it's quite helpful. Um, this is actually a patient uh, that had a ra diabetic rapidly progressing um, leg wound here. And we didn't see any air, but we saw this. This right here is that uniform layer of thickness. This is huge. This is probably like a full centimeter with some cellulitis above it. Notice there's no gas, right? There's no gas, but the clinical picture, rapid onset, the cellulitis with that uniform layer of thickness of just fluid deep to it, that was enough for me to call surgery. He went to the OR, it was neck fascia. Of course, this one's was a pretty advanced case, had abnormal labs and had a little fever. So I had some systemic findings as well, but in this case, the ultrasound really uh, cinched the diagnosis for me. This was the really the only study um, that I could find that actually showed the actual sensitivity of ultrasound in general and specificity. Um, and it had some pretty decent numbers compared to our physical examination, especially a specificity of 93% for ultrasound and a sensitivity of 88%. I happen to think these are pretty good numbers. Any questions on an NSTI, Caleb? So usually you, you just look for the fluid accumulation subcutaneously, right? Like, yeah. So it's like basically it's muscle layer. I look for that fluid below the subcutaneous layer above that. 
And of course, like the thing I'm usually looking for is gas, right? And then if I don't see that gas, then I look for that uniform layer of a uh, fluid. And that's differentiated from an abscess by, um, you know, an abscess is like encapsulated and circular. And as you fan through it, it'll like be gone. It'll get bigger and then go away as you as you fan through it. And that makes sense because if it's like a, you know, pocket, and that's how, that's how, that's how um, spheres work, right? Um, whereas this uniform layer of air, you scan, it's going to like stay in that subcutaneous tissue. It'll, it'll taper off, right? Because, you know, it's not like the whole leg or the whole arm um, is going to be abnormal, um, but um, it will taper off. So it's usually right below the subcutaneous tissue in between subcutaneous tissue and muscle layer. Yes. yes. Okay. Got it. Sweet. Yeah, great. Now, a couple things on fake outs, um, and this is for NSTI. This is complex, and I, I have seen a few of these, um, and this study actually kind of like talks about it. And I saw this, I like, you know, I I'd always do when I'm doing my lectures, when I'm doing like a, a revamp of my lectures, I'll like scan, I'll go on PubMed, um, and Caleb, I don't know if you're you know, like academically inclined, and most people aren't, and most people like do community medicine and do a great job. Um, but if you're ever interested, I can like kind of walk you through how I do my literature search. But all that to say, I, I do this like this search and I found this one kind of case study and it actually talked about how you can have very similar findings. If you have somebody with chronic cellulitis, they can actually get calcifications within that cellulitis that can look just like um, uh, gas, right? The difference would be um, clinical features, of course, and then notice this right here, this is the calcification, the subcutaneous tissue. You see how it's there's it's pretty bright and then there's a black shadow deep to it. This complete dropout, this complete shadow is more likely with calcifications. Whereas if you have a dirty shadow, see how this is a bit more on the gray side? This dirty shadow is more consistent with an air artifact shadow due to um, a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Um, so it's just something that, to keep an eye out. I mean, this calcification of the subcutaneous tissue is rare, but also an NSCI is rare. If you're ever not sure, of course, it's always a good idea to err on the side of like not discharging this patient home, getting some more imaging, getting some lab work to have the some other uh, clues to help you figure out if this is something that you really need to worry about or not. That makes sense? Yep. Sweet. So how do we feel about um, soft tissue ultrasound right now? Are we feeling good? Good, yeah. I actually had a one yesterday that that was pretty look, look consistent with cellulitis oh really and and it was an abscess or what no it was just it was a cellulitis the guy had like a red ankle and we scanned it and it was like yeah it looked like cellulitis yeah i mean and that's the thing is that it's helpful um and and often it's going to confirm what you thought but again like what's the downside of that right if it confirms what you had suspected great you're like more confident in your decision to send the patient home on antibiotics um or vice versa and sometimes what i do also is in locations where it, like I might've gotten the CT scan without the ultrasound. For instance, the abdomen, um, uh, I wanna know like, hey, is this actually going down in the peritoneum? Um, I can actually look and say like, oh, I can easily see that this is below it. And also, honestly, it helps with um, uh, just abscesses in general. Like I say, you see some, it's an abscess. I actually had one the other day where it was, it was right here. Um, you know, the axillary artery is right there and I didn't wanna, I don't wanna lance the axillary artery, but I was able to plan very well how to uh, drain that apart and and be safe with not even touching the axillary artery. I've done that before in the groin as well, where I had a patient that had a groin abscess and I could easily see how far it was from the femoral artery and femoral vein. And I was very comfortable opening that up because I was like, oh, there's a solid, you know, four or five centimeters between the more deep wall of the abscess um, to where important structures are. So you ever do um, also be planning. Yeah. Like Okay, so yeah, basically I, tracking and until you hit the... Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do that to actually guide a drainage. One of them is if you have a small one, um, you uh, what I'll do is I'll just basically identify it in one plane and I'll mark the skin on one side and then I'll identify it 90 degrees off and then mark it here. And then I basically then bring those two together and mark right there a little X. And that is a place where the abscess is located. And I know exactly where to go if they're smaller. And then if there's other structures like close by that you're a little nervous about, you can always try a needle aspiration, almost like you do an IV. And we can do the same thing, get the needle right in that pocket and then aspirate if you ever have any issues with it there. So you can use it, although I will say it's almost like paras. 
where I don't usually do it dynamic, but in the, the cases where it's helpful, it's very helpful. I hope that was helpful for you all. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send me a tweet, email, Instagram. Check me out on LinkedIn. Just let me know what you think of soft tissue ultrasound. Don't forget to check out the Core Ultrasound website. Check out our courses on there. We have fundamentals. We have our question bank. We have some live courses that we put together and recorded it. They're all on the courses.coreultrasound.com section of our website. I hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.